Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here for this session, which is about bridging the gap between method and creative madness. As, as you all know, there is supposed to be some method to cinema, but usually it ends up as creative madness. And I have with me three very, very fine people to talk about it. Of course, Edmund Kingsley, an actor, Jan Graveson, an actor again, Viba, who's a writer. So let's try, and, and she's also directed a film recently. So let's get their perspective on what they feel, uh, you know, what is, what is method in, in, in your business and then how does it usually end up as creative madness? Or the other way around. Uh, Ed? Um, so I think the, the useful thing I've found is although everybody is creating together and everybody is creative, I think it's to find out what your job is in a process and stick to that because film sets are mad because they um, only exist for a short time. You're sort of creating something fictional, but it has to, it has to be a world that you're all in. Uh, and there are stresses and strains and the lights going and everything else is happening around you. So I think it, whatever film set you find yourself on as an actor, um, I always end up just thinking I'm going to leave everybody else to do their job. I'm going to focus on the bit that I can be responsible for, uh, and, for and, and, and then it becomes rather than, in fact, I'd say you shouldn't think of yourself as an artist, as an actor when you're on film set. I think it's all about craft and being an artisan and just focusing on your, um, keep, keeping to what you know how to do. But, and each film set is different. I mean, each film set has a different... Uh, culture to it, depending on who's at the top, who's the, what the what the writer is, who the director is, uh, where you're filming. But as long as you hold on to the bits that you have control over, I think that's that's the way through for me. <laughs> so that's more that's more method. Well, I mean, if you're talking about this, but there's there's method method acting where you really go deeply into your role. But I'm talking about the, th the, um, the method on set. Yeah, if you try and take responsibility for the whole. Mm. I, don't, I think it's unhelpful. Uh, there's only certain things actors can help with. And I think the only thing you can do is your bit. If you have actors, and also you only have a finite amount of energy. So I think it's always better to. Yeah, what I, what I gather from you is uh, usually you have between 50 to 200 or 300 people on a film set. So, uh, you know, if a few of them decide to go beyond their own defined roles, then that would create that madness. And then one, then the others like you who are still with working within the framework of your own defined role have a problem or to adapt or to, or you, you also get into that madness. It's also about your perspective. I mean, it's the same reason I don't think it's ever terribly useful for actors to give each other notes because we're within the story and we're, ta we're fighting the, the, our character's corner and we're engaging with that bit of the story. And if another actor starts, if an actor starts giving another actor notes, I don't think they've got the right place to stand to see the whole. They, they're sort of saying, this is how I do it, or this is what my character thinks about this. Why we have a director who is a sort of benevolent dictator and has the whole story in their head. And their, their responsibility is to take, it's almost like being a conductor of an orchestra and you, you play your instrument and he has to merge with this instrument, but, and it needs somebody who's steps back from that and make sure that there's a harmony in the whole. And I don't think, as actors, we can, we can never quite see that, especially if it's a series or something. You come in, you know, you come in halfway through the process um, in a story that's already rolling. You just have to have your antennae out for what the, the game is that you're playing and, um, and focus on that. Jen? I think, oh, that was loud. Oh. I think that you need um, both of these things as ingredients if you're an artist, a performing artist, that is, because to act well, you have to open yourself up and be vulnerable. Your soul and your guts and your mind and everything are open for the space of time that you are performing. And whether it's a stage performance or it's a film set, it's still the same principle. 
that in itself, for me, has always been a crazy thing to do. It's, it's mad in itself. The job itself is crazy. To dress up, pretend to be somebody else, speak like somebody else, walk like somebody else. It's actually, it is crazy. It's a crazy thing to do. But the craft, as you were speaking about, is I feel that you have to find a way to be vulnerable, to produce your part effectively, but you also have to be crazy to want to even do that in the first place. So that's why I see bridging the gap a little bit with regards to being an actress or actor or a performer, because it is a very strange thing to do. I've always thought it, which is why I'm attracted to it myself. I'm going to respond as a writer because that's what I've primarily been doing all these years. So uh, when we talk of creative brilliance, we're talking about, we're assuming uh, uh, creative madness is brilliance, it's magical, it's just, you know, it's, it's a whole lot of light that's flashing before you. But all of this, especially in our field, needs to be honed a little, needs to be reined a little for it to make sense to the audience because ultimately we're making it for the audience. So like uh, Ed and Jan said, it's the art and craft. So if you define creative brilliance as art, then the craft has to come in. And in writing, there are there is an internal method and there's an external method. So internal is essentially the structure in which you tell the story and it has to ring true. It is also the characters that you develop. So in life, people do things which are out of character, but in films, characters have to do things which have been defined for them. Otherwise, the audience will not digest it. So that's the internal methodology of making sure your writing is working. And the external for a writer uh, is in terms of the budget, the production, the actor's abilities. Sometimes, I mean, you can visualize whatever you want, but the budgets have to allow for that. So the producer comes in, uh, the production designer comes in, all of that you have to consider, and then maybe go back to reining your mad creative madness a little bit more. And then there's a third part, which is actually the madness from the external world, which doesn't make sense in creativity at all. I'm not going into the details, but it's about, why don't we just do it like this? Sorry, we cannot do it like this, because the story doesn't work. But the person who says, why don't we do it like this, is either a star or uh, the producer or the funder. And you have to, so that is the madness which is outside of creativity. <laughs> and you have to deal with that. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's an interesting perspective. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Ed, about bridging the gap, Yeah. Uh, can you tell us of some real instances where you've had to do that on some sets or, you know, personalities where you found they are, uh, directors obviously tend to decide their personalities tend to decide whether the, the set is going to work with method yeah. or with madness. So, I mean, building on what you, were, what you have to do in every situation, I think, is make sure that you're, you're fully armed with, a, with all of your research, your script. I do st uh, lots and lots of pencil and paper work with a script before I start, and I'll go through. And, and there's a technique called actioning, where for every, every line you have, you try and find out what your character is trying to do to the person you're talking to. So you find a, it's, it comes from the sort of method tradition. So you're always trying to find a transitive verb, so it could be to excite or to terrify. So that's, and that's quite sort of top of the head stuff that you start doing. And then once that gives you a shape of a character and a sort of way that they behave in the world. So it's sort of detective work from the script. And from then you get a sense of how they are in the world, how they interact with people. And then you find, I often find music helps. I make a playlist of songs that's and then once you've done all of that, you can kind of throw it all away and react to whatever's going on. And that's when you get on a set and you find out what kind of, what the, what the culture of that set is. But you have to have that foundation there quite strongly, I think. And then you can be in somewhere like, well, Capsule, for example, the one that was mentioned earlier. I was supposed to be in a spaceship 
orbiting the Earth that was malfunctioning. It was supposed to be that the British had built a spaceship in 1954 and kept it secret, and now it was breaking, and I was in the middle of it. Um, but of course, I wasn't in a spaceship. I was in a barn in Essex. Um, and all of the budget had gone into building this spaceship, which was beautiful. It was made of kind of old bits of Bakelite and, and real uh, air, air. So that was, it felt quite like being in a spaceship. As soon as you stepped out of it, there were horses going past. There was a Zumba class in the next barn. And the, the real world kept trying to get in and interfere. And also, um, well, it was only, it was only, I was the only actor on set because all of the voices were on, uh, was supposed to be coming through a radio. So it was a very good script editor in another room feeding me the lines. But there was no, um, there was no other actor in a scene to kind because of, often you grip onto the people you're working with and you hold onto that relationship. And that's the bit, that's the kind of, that's your lifeline, whatever other craziness is going on. Uh, but with this, I found that the lifeline I had to hold on to was, was the capsule itself, was this really, and it was completely surrounded me, and it felt uncomfortable and claustrophobic and everything it should be. And I ended up, even when they were setting up between takes, spending hours staying and sitting in there. I didn't really like getting out and going back into the real world. I wanted to hold on to that, what that feeling was, and, the, and something almost real, um, that kept me in an imaginative place and in an, em in an emotional place. Um, and I think if you can find something like that in any situation, something that connects you to the character and connects you to whatever it is in the story that, that um, does what you need it to to, 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 uh, to to remain in that world. Because there's always something. There's always something in your island. There's always somebody checking their phone and trying to see where the catering company is. And you have to really try hard to hold on to the bit that, if your mind starts wandering, if you start drifting off, that, that kind of plugs you back into the story, and gets you back into the into the character you've created through the work I was talking about earlier. But um, yeah, but it was always. And then it was quite a shock stepping out of the capsule and going and you know horses trotting by and and not being hit by a tractor. I think, yeah, reiterating on what you're saying, um, from an acting point of view, um, you have to do your homework. It's really quite simple. You have to learn your lines. However, you have to learn them. For me, I'm dyslexic, and it's an absolute nightmare to learn my scripts. So I struggle with that. Um, I used to hide the fact that I was dyslexic because I'm an actress. Actresses work with words and scripts. And I used to think to myself, why have I gone into a profession <laughs> that uses words so predominantly when I'm severely dyslexic? Why would you do that to yourself? But that's another part of the madness. Um, so I'd just like to, if I may, um, stretch your minds a little bit about the differences between filming and theater from an acting point of view, because it's, it's an area that's never really touched, and there is quite a difference with these two forms of, of performing. Um, hence, what we're talking about, the madness and everything, uh, when you're on a set, you have time to do takes with the, your director. Your relationship with your director, usually you don't meet the directors before this, this work, so you have to form a bond with your director very, very quickly. Hence, you need to do your homework and know your lines, know what you're doing, and be on the ball. Um, when it's theater, for instance, a show in the West End or a musical or a, a theatrical tour, um, you have three weeks to rehearse in England. You have three weeks every single day you rehearse. So you are completely blocked. You know what you're doing. Now, sometimes, on the set, things go wrong. Um, but they are conveniently sorted out very quickly, very aptly. However, if something goes wrong on the stage, that really leaves you in a, in a bit of a mess because you have a live audience in front of you who've paid a lot of money for their tickets. And they're all looking at you. And if the lights don't work and something goes wrong and the sound goes, or what happened to me actually on Broadway was one of the actors was meant to bring a prop on the stage. It was a knife actually, when, in the days when you could use knives on stage, real knives. Um, 
And they couldn't find the prop. They exited the stage and they couldn't find the prop behind. And we could hear this actor saying, where the f is the knife? What? It's got to be somewhere, isn't it? It's where f I am. And I was like, okay. Now we are the actors on the stage and this is Broadway. Can you believe it? You know, and I'm thinking, this is where you snap out of the the professionalism into the where am I time warp coming out of the aircraft the, the the spaceship and the horses are go it's that suddenly your vulnerability closes and you are somewhere else and then you're snap so you have to think very fast you have to improvise on stage and we did do that by the way we managed we got a 21 minute standing ovation at the end of the show for that because the audience felt like they were living the experience with us. But these are just some of the areas where it can get very, very insanely crazy. Um, so I just would wanted to highlight those to you. Do you ever feel almost, this isn't quite the right, but almost, particularly filming, almost quite grateful for something just going slightly wrong and surprising you? Something that almost knocks you off the rails and then you have to fight to get... Yeah. It can sometimes be... Beca because it's, again, it's something that's something real to hold on to that's happened. Sometimes those accidents, or if you're in a long run of the play and something, somebody stands in a different, just something that makes you go and, and kind of, uh, um, the unexpected can sometimes be a real gift. Yes, absolutely. And not, I mean, not if the camera falls over or you know, an actor falls down a train cover or something, <laughs> but, but a little thing going wrong that just, that, that reminds you that you're still a human being talking to another human being right. in a situation. Yes can be really quite, yes, yes, it can yes, sort of like yes. put some electricity yes. into the scene. Yes. If somebody doesn't, I was in a Julius Caesar uh, once where the soothsayer didn't come on and warn Caesar that he was going to be murdered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That sort of changed the story a bit. Yeah. Um, so if it goes <laughs> so wrong that, that the story collapses, then that's unhelpful. But those, those moments of real those human moments, connection are, are they're quite They're valuable. magical. You never forget them. You really don't. And how you and your fellow actors get out of these situations, you never, ever forget it. It's it's quite a it's quite a life skill, you know. You can apply these things to life. Performing arts is amazing for that. Vibha, any experiences you want to talk about in terms of writing where you've had to deal with uh, bridging this gap? I want to continue writing. <laughs> 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 so yeah, they can talk about Don't it. Don't take but names. Yeah, but you can mention. Some. No, but I think I covered it uh, broadly when I said that, you know, the, whether it's the funder or the producer or the star comes along and says, change this. <coughs> and actually, if I start telling you experiences, it will be so obvious. So I don't want to get into But how did, you, how did you manage to you do that? You sometimes you manage to, uh, sometimes you manage to cope with it. Sometimes uh, you walk out of the project. I mean, these are your options, actually, because uh, everyone talks about, especially in India, everyone says, oh, we don't have uh, good writers or whatever, but the writers have a voice. Uh, all of us are storytellers. All of us feel uh, uh, we know what to say. So, uh, but very few people appreciate the fact that writing on a blank piece of paper or on an M on a blank computer screen is actually creating something and then the others are bouncing off it. They are uh, reacting to it. And uh, the, the method part of it, which is the craft, is something like any other craft. It comes to you with experience and with learning. It's not like you are born with the craft. You may have the art, but you have to hone your craft. So if we've been writing for so long, then we've been honing our craft. We can still go wrong. That's all right. But, uh, you know, somebody, just because you have the money coming and saying, do this, is a little... Uh, so I'll ask one I last... I can see uh, him laughing <laughs> away there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so one, one, one last question for uh, Ed and Jan, because you've both worked in different environments. Does that also play a role? But do you find that certain cultures are prone to method and certain more towards madness? So, Ed, first. Um, 
I do you mean do you mean cultures around the world different? Yeah. Um, to some extent, I think the big the bi the biggest difference is what medium you're working in. So theatre is obviously very different to film, and uh, like a a long running television series feels very different to a to a film that only exists for a few weeks. So those there are those differences. It's and a huge amount, especially in film. Not quite so much in television because you might get different directors coming for different. Um, but a huge amount in film is to do with the director and the creative team at the centre. And actually, that more than almost anything else creates the culture on set. If it's all, if it's if they're the centre of the storm and calm and everything's happening around them, then that filters out. If they're in constant crisis, then this, I mean, you can have a you can have a brilliant first AD who can protect you from that a lot. But basically, that's why you know, that's why everybody listens to the director because they're the and the writer. I mean, it also comes from the quality of the writing. You know, it's, it's <laughs> um, you know, if that creates a different culture as well, depending on the, the, the whether you've got stuff that you just trust and rely on, and or, or whether it's something that's uh, in theatre. With the, if we're working with a new writing in theatre, it can even be collaborative with a writer. So you've got a writer in the room with you working. So that's a different thing again. But I think each each set is sort of its own. Um, microcosm and its own culture and that I mean there are differences if you like uh, for if you're working in the Czech Republic for example the crews are fantastic and really on it and you just feel like it's you're getting into a well-oiled machine and it just works if you go somewhere if you do one of those long-running British series like casualty or doctors you sort of you feel like you're a, a cog in a machine and you just fit in and everything is happening around you and it's almost like you can't see any effort going in, but um, but they pay really well. Yeah, and it's <laughs> great, and it's and actually, and then the nice thing is, all you have to worry about is your is is your bit of it, is your performance, because you know that everything else around you works. It's not like a short film or some or a, a low budget film where you think this could all fall apart at any minute. So I'm just <laughs> going to go and sit quietly in the corner while they have another argument, and then I'll come back and do my my scene in a minute. Oh, so I think more more than where you are, it's the people you're with that, that's, that's, that's the big difference in, th in terms of each film set. Yes, I agree. And it's always about, for me, it's about the director. It's also about very good writing. Because if you have a good script that you've learned, and you have your motivation and your reasons, and you know what you're doing with that script, and it's mapped, whether it's stage, theater, film, TV, that is, a, that is very grounding for an actor because you have your script, that's your skeleton. So the writing, the writers are super important when it comes to, for actors, because we can't, uh, we, if we have no script, there's nothing for us to bring to life and bring off the paper. And that whole, um, what happens in between getting a script absorbing a script, learning the script, reciting the script, col coloring what I call coloring the script um, with uh, dynamics. Um, that is a process in itself. Um, but with regard to your question, um, and having now shot quite a few things in India, I have to say how utterly shocked I was when I first went onto a film set in India. And uh, that's not, that's not a, a negative note at all. That is um, because I'd come from England and I'd come from t mainly television and then film and a lot of musical theater in the West End. That's a completely different thing. But the sets in England are quiet environments. They are orderly. They are efficient. They are, everybody has their turn, makeup, uh, hair. Everybody is given a call on set to do what they need to do for the artists or for themselves or whatever it is. And um, I thought that was what it was like everywhere until <laughs> I came to India. And I got onto my first film set. I won't tell you what it was. And I was just, how on earth does this even happen? How does it get in the can? How do, they, how, does it, how do you get through the day? Never mind the minute. I mean, this is astonishing. But it 
does. It really, really does. And there, as I say, again, we have more method, we have more madness. However you want to perceive that, everybody's different. We're all individuals. We all see it as different things. It's madness. Yeah. Absolute madness. I, I, you know, the noise, things being shifted across the set while you're trying to get to the other side of the set, uh, you're being directed to be over there, but you've got to climb over the lighting rig with a cup of coffee going that way, and somebody else, and screaming and shouting, and la you know, and, and makeup, and, and the makeup is following like this, <laughs> and the hair is on you, the hair's on you, know, and you're like, what are you doing? What are I'm trying to have a cup of coffee, yes, but, 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 I was like, this is astonishing for me. Honestly, <laughs> how does this work? Isn't it absolutely magical? That's what I thought. It wasn't derogatory. It wasn't negative. I just thought, this, I love this. It's absolute chaos. <laughs> yet, yet, these films are being made. These films are coming out. They're being made. And they're beautiful pieces of art. How does it happen? <laughs> you know? Because I've come from the quiet into the storm. Oh my God, the drama. And I love it for that. I love India for that. I love India for that, honestly. Vivek, I just more. wanted to no, ask okay. you, you've, uh, you've done films in India and abroad. Why don't you answer this question as well? See, uh, it's easier to, uh, it's easier, t it would be more fun if I, if I started in England, if I started in England or in the West and came here. But I started here, so to me, you know, this was usual. But you should be this shocked, Vivek, when things, are, when things are in place and, uh, you know. <laughs> no, it gets boring. Exactly. It gets boring when... Things work like an oiled machinery. In India, like, we operate like, um, like God does, right? It's like going to Singapore. Everything's chaotic and we make sense out of it. It's, it. it's like going to Singapore. So boring. See, I was used to the madness. So to me, that's... Method. You know, that's, that's normal. So I never realized... And to be honest, uh, there, is, there is method in... Well, it's calmer. It's calmer. Things, it's calmer. Things function. You know, like nobody disturbs, nobody talks. Those kind of things, yes. But I found directors anywhere in the world as confused as the ones here. <laughs> so, you know, they make as bad films as they could possibly make here. So really, I, I, don't, I don't see that method as something so important uh, for the creation of a film. And the, the guy who I admire, well, currently, uh, who, the, the director who I admire most, is my dear friend Shekhar Kapoor. And he says in the chaos in India actually gives, you know, gives us the, it, it makes us deliver such uh, good films. And he misses that chaos outside. I, I think um, I'd like to call it something, both of sides of this coin, which can also shift very quickly. You can go from one state to the other very, very quickly, in a split second. And that goes for film sets as well. I've seen people stropping here. Stropping is a Northern England word for somebody that just um, decides that they're not happy anymore and, ha and gets a little bit dramatic and makes their mouth go and throws the dummy out of the pram because they want to get their own way. I've seen stropping. I mean, it's not even allowed in England. You're thrown off the set and you're fired. If you throw a straw, you're not allowed. But here, everybody's no, straw. Here, here, the unions are very powerful. Yeah. They would throw us out. Yes, but <laughs> I've seen straws. Yeah, we, can't, we can't throw anybody out. With actors, I've seen straws here. Actors, but I think. Actors, yes. And that's. <laughs> they are, they, we don't have. You know, the three or four companies try to bond. But there's something called bonding uh, in the mm -hmm. West, where the actors also sign that contract. And then, of course, they are answerable and they, they have to be, you know, if they, may be, if they make any mistake yeah. or, or, or because of their uh, issues, if the production suffers, then they are responsible and no other producer would then be allowed to use them in their films. 
once you uh, fa once you uh, have a bonding issue problem then no producer would use you but we don't have that they tried to do that here of course no actor signed the bond so because they know they're going to do this they know they're going to be misbehaving throwing throwing tantrums but hollywood you 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 worked in uh, in new york yes and i don't know how you know i don't know much about the stage about broadway and but i i go to la often ed 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 has worked on many big hollywood films stars there are the same they they throw as many tantrums sometimes they even write those tantrums into their contracts <laughs> so the producer is bound to let them do it well i mean lots of things are in the contract which are <laughs> as bad as tantrums yeah i just want to say this but at the end of the day uh, it's it's uh, every individual has a process so whether it's mo more of creative madness less of method or vice versa either a good film comes out of it or a bad film comes out of it which is true in india and outside so to each her own i'm being correct gender correct <laughs> so to each person it's his or her own but uh, yeah i mean the audience should like the film and uh, whatever the process be it should work for the person there is i mean it's interesting this thing of actors throwing there is a kind of there's a th there's a difference between being a star and being a leading actor and i th i think i'd rather aspire to be a leading actor than this because then you have a kind of in the same way a director can create a culture on set mm -hmm. the leading actors can also create and, that, and and that's a difference and i think that's a choice you have to make when you're lucky enough to get one of those roles because there'll always be if you if you're lucky enough to get one of those roles then there'll be people with small and they've all as well as an eye on the director they often have an eye on how the how the you know the 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 bigger parts or the names or whatever you want to call them are behaving and you can if you start throwing your toys out of the pram you can really ruin the atmosphere on on in a in a thi particularly in a theater company when you're all together but al e also if you're on a movie if you because it gives permission to everybody else to start doing that yeah. and it's such a drain on energy and energy is finer and film making it's wonderful it's a great privilege to do but it can be exhausting as well because you're kind of coiled like a cold spring all day and then you get to do your two minutes of actual acting and then you have to go and save it up again for the next bit so and it's a weird rhythm and it can and i don't i've seen people misbehave and i think how on earth have you got the <laughs> energy to do this and give a performance as well and if everybody starts doing that then you can you can get into trouble quite quickly i think So it, it gets kind of infectious then. If one person does it or the lead director or big big star does it, then others start taking things casually and everything goes out of sync. Yeah, and it, and it's also a status thing. They think, well, if that's how if that's how I'm supposed to behave when I get big, then I'll start behaving that's like that now true. and I'll get that's big. That's true. That happens here, I guess. The you know the people see them behave like this, and they think this is how I should be. Mm -hmm. Here I can tell you a positive story that uh, I've worked with Aziz Mirza and he talks about a film that Aziz Mirza is a very uh, big director here and he uh, has worked with Shah Rukh Khan a lot so he talks about a film in which which he was directing and Shah Rukh was the hero and uh, they were you know so all stars need to have their cars and the sizes of the cars matter and so on and so forth and if they had started providing cars to all the lead actors then it would have been very chaotic and expensive so sharukh just quietly went and sat in the bus and he says aziz if i am sitting in the bus nobody's ever going to ask you for a car and that is how everyone came and sat in the bus and they traveled to wherever they had so i mean this is just building on what ed said that if the lead actor actually takes the lead and uh, ensures that no tantrums are being thrown then everyone else behaves So can we get some questions now, perhaps? Yeah. Actually, it's not a question. Uh, <clears throat> more, I would like to share a similar experience that uh, Jean. Uh, I have, most of my life, I have worked in television. And uh, 
there are two parts, studio television with multi-camera like we have here, and then outside. So multi-camera, we had a very senior producer, television producer from Canada visiting us. And he came and he said, let's see how you work and what you do. And I was in a very big government setup where all facilities were there. And we said, there's a show going on and let's see how it is. And he went in, it was just before that, he said, okay, this so. So, and then I said, now we're going to start the recording. He said, have you done the blocking? No. Then, I don't see the camera cards yet. Are, uh, no camera cards. Then, how are you going to do it? No, we have, have you rehearsed? Yeah, casually outside somewhere. Then, and then sit, sit, just sit, just sit. And the show started, and the pr producer on the panel, it was not me, someone else, started calling the cameras, and he started jumping on, take one, do this, that. And this fellow from Canada was almost about to faint. How do you make shows like this? <laughs> and then he saw the show, and he said, wow, you made it out of this. It's wonderful. <laughs> and that's how it's happening. Yes, yes. But I just wanted to ask, add a question to it. Doesn't it sometime happen that without rehearsals or without something, may, maybe in, may not be in fiction, but in news or somewhere, that no rehearsal, no preparation, nothing, but you have to make a show. Does it happen ever? Yeah, whose line is it anyway? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, and how do you cope with it then? <laughs> I don't do that show. <laughs> <laughs> it does happen, it does happen, but it's set up to be that way. Yeah, it's set up to be that way. It's set up to be that way. It's improvised. Yeah, yeah. So it, there's already an awareness that that is how, how it is. So you are aware of it. Whereas what I was referring to earlier was just the you know like you were talking about the Canadian directors. Same thing. You know. I think it's you know. I mean, can we say? Um, I don't know how to put it. Um, Method, mad method. See, I know uh, another instance, and I, I wasn't part of it, but I had friends who worked on the film, Slumdog Millionaire, famous mm -hmm. film, Danny Boyle. When Danny came, he thought he would be shooting on the streets of Mumbai, of course, and everything would be locked. <coughs> no way you can go out with a camera on the streets of <coughs> Mumbai with 20, 30 people. So they had to adapt themselves. Danny used to sit in a car not on the set not exactly on the set no. and the first AD would be there Indian guy walking around amongst the Indians the DOP was carrying a little camera in his hand like this which nobody realized because it was not uh, being held against uh, you know on this level eye level and that's how they shot a lot of the sequences in uh, the Dharavi area of Mumbai which is you know if you go there it's difficult to walk even without a camera, <laughs> with a camera. Yeah, magical. I mean, there's just a way. So you have to find yeah. your. You have to find your way. That's it. I think. I mean, that is. That's kind of some. If somebody said to me, uh, "Can you sum up India in one sentence?" I mean, this is apart from anything. It would be a way. A way will always be found. A way will always be found, and that applies to everything. I mean, that's that's coming from me from a person from England who's lived in India for a, f a few years now, but it, I, do, I do keep talking about it a lot, I know, but it's just, it's such magic, it's such a magical thing, and when it comes to sets and things like that, I still thankfully stand in awe of how it all happens, and I never want to lose that um, feeling on a set or otherwise, where it comes to performances and acting and all the different aspects that ha are part of it and how they fall into place. Um, but I never want to lose that naivety, as it were, of thinking, wow, you know, like Alice in Wonderland. It's incredible. It's incredible, really. Yeah, a way will always be found. There's a word for it in India called Jugaad. We always find that. That's the word and uh, and it's, it's fantastic. I'm like, really, there, there are things that you hear about in India, which is not part of the subject that we're talking about, but that is fascinating. And I'm very proud of that because 
you're not straight jacketed into this is the way this is the way you should think and this is how it is so yeah vivek may I? so first and foremost thank you vivek i had a great time to this panel really enjoyed myself for a long long time i enjoyed myself i just <laughs> i just wanted to add two comments to it first is on uh, your comment I, way back i was pres uh, going to make a big presentation i'm from the corporate world i have nothing to do with movies so so we hired a british actor to teach us you know on the stage presence and to give uh, delivery you know it is a it is a big event and we are unveiling something really big so the british actor after some time told me that you are a director's nightmare <laughs> 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 never do films i said why you never remember your lines you speak what you want to speak i said yeah <laughs> that is how it tends to be i can't really you know mug up and come and give a speech so i know for listening to you about the dialectic part and i, I remember exactly that and he after that he just gave us said you do what you want to do i'm fine you, know? <laughs> you do a great job and the second was the reverse part of it i think from india i had an assignment um, in one of the western worlds and the first time i sat in an open office normally we have all these cubicles here and i was used to just saying uh, what was the document there could you just send it out and i would have lunch when i felt hungry so the head there called me once and said look here there's certain rules to be followed i said like what i said you have lunch at between 12:30 to 2 and and when you have to talk to somebody there's a meeting to be no fixed in a calendar i said now i'm coming back here again i can't work like this like <laughs> if i have something i want it now like, i can't wait for 3 hours to have a conversation forget what was to be talked about you know yeah. so i think the reverse side also is very very yes. painful no for me it was big pain to be on that side and it, like it took me a couple of months to really settle and understand how how would i know like i have talked to you i wait for 3 hours when you say yes to my meeting request then i go and talk to you in a cubicle it can't happen like if i want to talk i would talk right now you know? yeah. so it yeah. was it was good fun but thank you vivek no it's a re really pleasure pleasure to have you here tapan so um uh, vivek ji i have uh, i firstly have to uh, say something is uh, and i am i dare to say this because i am the publisher of a lifestyle magazine when we deal with a lot of celebrities day in and day out uh but uh, at the same time i personally feel that a celebrity or a lead actor or a actor becomes a superstar or a star uh, because of the people around him and because of the people who watch him uh, work and all of that so uh, in spite of all of that uh, the superstar uh, the tantrums that the superstar throws is on the same people who made him or her what they are and that's ironic Uh, but i have a question for you when we spoke about uh, jan's experience jan you have wonderful experiences though uh, when we spoke about jan's experiences on the sets uh, where everything is chaotic and all of that i uh, when uh, as far as we agree that uh, though in, uh, sets in india are very chaotic but the product comes out to be really good uh, is there a way possible that uh, sets in india can become more systematic and uh, is there a way around it uh, how do we go about it actually uh, what uh, ed mentioned is the uh, is the answer to your question amir khan sets are always as good as any in the world and that's because that lead actor he, whether he's the producer or not he runs this he runs every part of his films and he makes sure everything is perfect silence means silence no uh, not not the sound of a pin dropping yeah but well, i can try but you were there on my set you saw how chaotic it was <laughs> in pune na tum jano na hum blue diamond <laughs> no it's easier now it's easier now than it was earlier but yeah so there are sets in india which are very well managed because there is only one guy who does that so that's down to the director right the director no in, in this case the actor producer. Well, but the, 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 the whoever is the main person mm. it's up to him okay. so but in this case amir khan is the actor mm -hmm. but he calls the shots everybody else is not so relevant in right. on his sets yeah i think in england um it's there are just rules and regulations in fact there are too many of them i feel sometimes it works it's slick and it gets done but i mean but it doesn't have the magic though not like it gets boring but it's it's 
<laughs> I'm here. <laughs> Try and get me out. <laughs> but yes, I think, and also, you know, also we have very strict um, union rules and regulations. In fact, it's not as strict as it used to be, but we have Actors' Equity, for instance. We have Musicians' Union. They're very, very powerful. They, are, they can come on the set and they can um, stop a shoot and they can do this in the West End, in the theatres. They're, they're very, very powerful, in particular the Musicians' Union. Um, so if there are musicians on a set, um, they're, they're, they, um, you know, they have to have a certain amount of money over time. If they go one second over the, the time, then it goes into a second day or another day or another 24 hours. So um, the, the rules and regulations, the unions... Um, Actors' Union Equity is is very very powerful and very very hot on actors' rights. Food three times a day. No, but what about you know, what about the actors who misbehave? Um, they're that, not. That's where the even the union or producers they do nothing. Mm. They accept those stars because they need them. It depends how they misbehave. You see, because I mean, if you look at somebody like Spike Milligan, he's an absolute nightmare rebel. You know, but and he misbehaves. Or used to. God bless his soul. He used to misbehave everywhere, but everybody adored him. So, in a similar way, you know. Um, but he was such a genius. Anyway, what do you think about this, Ed? Well, I wonder if one of the I haven't worked in it. I'd love to work in India, but I haven't worked in India, so I can only speak about um, European and American experience. I wonder if with British. And some British actors behave appallingly, and I'm not going to name any names, but some of them do. But we're, and do stop me if I'm speaking out of turn here, because I might not be right, but particularly in London, one of the nice things about being an actor in London is that you go from theatre to film to television, back to theatre, and there's something in, and lots of your first few, lots of actor training is um, sort of more theatre-based, and there's a sort of ensemble feeling that's quite important. And I wonder if that slightly tempers some of the worst excesses that actually the idea of a kind of a company of actors is very, very strong in, a, in, 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 the, U, in the UK. Um, and we do have stars, obviously, and you have people who are kind of out there in the stratosphere. But there's a, there's a, there's a um, we have a kind of an idea of an, of an acting company really drummed into us, which goes back to the Elizabethans and those, you know, the King's men and, and the Lord Chamberlain's men, and that actually it's about plays are made by a, by a group and stories are made by a group. And I think it's not always true. You know, there, there are people who... But I think that's quite, that's quite a big part of a British actor's thinking. America? Ameri well, the American films I've worked on have filmed over... Like, for example... Um, uh, Hugo, the, the Scorsese film, wasn't an American film, but it was filming over here, so it used a lot of British actors. There is huge, I mean, I think you do get huge star power over there. Um, but, in, but with Hugo, of course, there was no bigger star than Scorsese. And again, it comes back to that, the culture that the central figure creates. And he was, it was a strip, because it was, um, the f I think it was the first film that was actually filmed in 3D. So it wasn't put in post. They were they were using a 3D camera, and he was, but because of that technology, he wasn't really on set with us. He was in. There was a sort of viewing tent around the corner that he was in, but when he walked on set, it was like the Pope coming in. Everybody sort of went quiet, and it was a huge, great crowd because it was supposed to be Melies. We they built a reconstruction of Melies, um, George Melies studio, in the back lot at Shepperton, so it was full of people. Um, and it was it was a very it was a sort of world with it bet between worlds because all of the costume department were in this mock up of a French studio in costume doing the costumes as if it was a real film studio all of the lighting guys were in costume doing the lighting in the studio so it was already lots of layers of reality going on but when he walked on set all of that stopped everybody went quiet and slightly bowed and he came up and the, but the, but he didn't do anything he was in the middle of that was talking very quietly and being quite humble and, and kind and polite and because he didn't need to because he had such status. But that's what I mean about being the sort the leading actors or the director. 
are really a kind of the geist, the spirit of the whole enterprise. And that was, I mean, it was, Hugo was vast. They re rebuilt a railway station in another studio with, a, with an actual train that came in and out. I mean, it was, the scale of it was extraordinary. But I think the bigger something is, the calmer you need the people in the middle of it to be, to balance so that everything comes back to the... No, I mean, <laughs> for it to be a happy experience, the bigger something is, the calmer the people in the middle have to be. And that was certainly true with that one. Any other questions? So, hello, everyone. So, so how does, in your experience, you said that uh, you kind of messed up and you, uh, you weren't able to find the prop on stage. So in your experience, how does one, you know, carry on with the stage where, you know, at one, so that the audience doesn't boo it? I knew somebody was going to say, <laughs> ask this question. Um, actually, it wasn't me that lost the prop. It was the other actor. <laughs> um, I'm, at this point, we were all three of us downstage, right? We were playing seven-year-olds. So my hair was in bunches. I was in a little dress playing a seven-year-old. This is on Broadway. And um, the person that couldn't find the knife just didn't come back on the stage. Which left me and my two fellow actors downstage right as seven-year-olds. And we all looked at each other and said, uh, you know, the script can only go so long. You can only kind of uh, crochet it out a little bit for a certain length of time. Now, this went on a long while. So in the end, um, I actually did this. <laughs> I'm going to show you what I did. And with two very reputable actors, one was here, one was here. And we realized that the person who had the knife, didn't have the knife, was never going to come back on the stage. <laughs> you know. So we were left. And um, you know, you're thinking, this is Broadway. It's not even like it's a small theater somewhere in, in Liverpool in, in England. It's Broadway, and we're here, and we're s now we're getting to a point where we're going to have to do something. So bearing in mind my hair was in bunches, and I was in a little dress, I just went, I thought, what did I do when I was seven? What did I do when I was seven? Yes, I know what I did. So it, I just went, say face off. And everybody clapped. And I thought, oh, that was good. Let's do more. Hey, Broadway, yeah, great. Let's do more. So we just went on and on and we played these games. Yes? And then in the end, the fellow actor of mine, he went, oh, enough of this. I'm going to go and get the knife. <laughs> so he went. And he got the knife. And that's how we got out of it. Thank you. Yes. So thank you so much for listening to us. And we hope you enjoyed this. We come to the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you very much.